Type 3 Meniere's disease is when you're having episodes of rotational vertigo, but you're also having vestibular symptoms in between those episodes. Now we're talking about things like dizziness, which could be feeling like you're rocking on a boat, could be feeling like you're floating, general instability, disequilibrium, sometimes blurry vision, but you're having symptoms in addition to those episodes, and you're having them between the attacks. So that's type three. Now, why would you wanna know what type you have? I'm, I'm a big fan of saying, know your type because there are different types of Meniere's disease and knowing which one you had is gonna go a long way to understanding what you need to be doing for successful treatment and management of the Meniere's disease. So let's get into that. Let's talk about the different causes of type three, exactly what it is and what you have to do about it. So let's quickly review the other type. Type one Meniere's is when you haven't had a vertigo attack in two years and obviously that's the best kind to have. So we're not gonna talk about that. Type two Meniere's disease is when you're having episodes of rotational vertigo, but no other vestibular or dizzy symptoms in between those attacks. And I made a video about that, I'll link to it here. Type four is when you're really not having any more episodes of rotational vertigo, but you're still having all these vestibular symptoms uh, despite not having attacks. We'll make another video on that later. Now, type three, you're having rotational vertigo attacks and you're having vestibular symptoms and dizziness symptoms in between those attacks. So you may have already been diagnosed, in addition to Meniere's, as having 3PD, or persistent postural perceptual dizziness. Or maybe you've been diagnosed with mild debarkment syndrome, or MDDS. Or you might even been diagnosed with anxiety, like anxiety is why you feel this way. Well, um, I think most people who are experienced enough in this field will tell you that if you have vestibular symptoms, they're gonna cause anxiety. And yes, some people with anxiety get vestibular symptoms, but most people that have Meniere's disease have anxiety because I mean, yours is a terrible condition. It makes you anxious. So it's, that's not really an explanation. What it really means to say that you have episodic vertigo attacks and you're having these vestibular symptoms in between the attacks, what that really means is that you have a circuit problem in addition to the Meniere's. What are the causes of these type three Meniere's disease cases? Well, there's all the metabolic stuff we've talked about before. And primarily that's something to do with the immune system. Uh, there's autoimmunity, there's allergies, there's autoinflammation, there's immune system deficiency. Uh, that's why I do testing like a lymphocyte MAP testing or lymphocyte immunophenotype testing, uh, which really helps you kind of dig down and look at someone's immune system and find out very quickly, you know, is their immune system normal? Uh, is it abnormal? If it is abnormal, in what way is it abnormal? Because everyone's got their own immune system fingerprint, so that's a really good test to get down deep and find out what's really going on. Now, I also do, in terms of evaluating these metabolic causes for type three, I do what's called uh, multiple tissue antibody testing because I mentioned the word autoimmune a second ago. A large number of people that make it to me that have Meniere's, it's unstable, they're still having symptoms. They often have an autoimmune problem they didn't know about. Now, it's not always an inner ear autoimmune problem, but very often they'll have an autoimmune problem outside the ear and because autoimmune problems are inflammatory, it's inflammation from that that is disturbing the function of their inner ear and keeping the Meniere's provoked. Another cause for type three Meniere's disease is just structural damage. There are some cases that are gonna need extreme treatment and that might be surgery, a shunt, it might be canal plugging because there's been structural changes in those structures in the inner ear that just aren't gonna be able to be fixed in either way. Type three also has circuit problems and that's really the defining point, right? The, the, the line between type two and type three is now you're getting these vestibular symptoms between the attacks of rotational vertigo. Now, why would that be happening? The balance stability pyramid, and I'll show a picture of it right here for you guys. This is a pretty simple model of understanding what makes you feel stable, right? And makes you not have vestibular symptoms. Well, you see, you've got down at the bottom corners, you've got vision, you have information coming from uh, uh, the inner ear, obviously, and then you've got information coming from the muscles and joints primarily in the upper neck. And at the top of that, you have the cerebellum. Now there's more structures involved, but that's a pretty simple way of looking at it. So one reason that people have type three Meniere's disease and they have these circuit problems is because that system I'm showing you there, it can't recalibrate. Because remember with Meniere's, what's happening is over time, one side's essentially being squashed and crushed. Now occasionally, you know, you get a real instability and it feels like it's over firing, but over the long term, one side, the side with the Meniere's disease, is getting crushed and the signals that it should be sending to the rest of the nervous system are being starved off and choked off. And so one reason you can have these vestibular symptoms is that system just can't recalibrate. Now, why would that happen? 
Well, it might not be able to recalibrate because the cerebellum is malfunctioning. Of course, I made a video on that a long time ago that I think you'll find very helpful. Uh, it's kind of the big error checker. It's the big recalibrator. It's the thing that helps reweight these different inputs. So if there's a problem with the cerebellum, uh, it's going to be difficult for the circuit to recalibrate. And that is something that some of these people that have type 3 have. There can also be a problem with how the brainstem nuclei, how healthy they are, whether we're talking about vestibular nuclei or some of the relay nuclei. If there's a problem with how those, those nuclei are working and how strong they are, you're going to have problems. Another thing is, I, I hesitated getting into this, but there's these things called otoliths, okay? Uh, if otolith integration is not working very well, you're primarily going to have problems with either what we call velocity storage, which is where you make a movement and that movement kind of echoes even though you stopped. And so you have this sensation that you're still moving even though you're not moving or a lot of floating uh, symptoms. The otoliths basically uh, take care of linear translations you know, side to side, forward, up and down. They, they tell you if you're tilted. So you can imagine if those signals are going wrong, you're going to have a lot of weird instability symptoms, uh, but not necessarily rotation. Another thing that can cause these vestibular symptoms in between attacks is the system tries to calibrate and compensate, but it overemphasizes one of the corners of the pyramid. For example, if it really, really reweights everything to vision, then you become very vision dominant. And while that may make you functional, it can make you very symptomatic. And what you'll end up with is visual motion sensitivity. And here's what that looks like. What it looks like is, like if I move, your brain can't tell if I'm moving or you're moving. And so it gives a, a conflict of signals and it makes you feel bad. Uh, it could happen when you're driving. It could happen if you're in the theater trying to watch a movie. If something moves in your visual scene and what you're looking at, your brain can't tell because it doesn't have a good reference point. It doesn't know that you're stable, okay? Uh, it's a very, very common thing and it can be treated. It can also overemphasize uh, the neck muscle part of this. And when that happens, people will have lots and lots of neck pain in addition to the following. Because of the strong relationship between these things I mentioned called otoliths and this suboccipital area, people can have problems with convergence with their eyes, and what that will show up as, they have problems with near viewing. So looking at the computer screen, looking at their phone, uh, they can make them very, very symptomatic. They're better viewing things far away. But they also, because their eyes don't converge the way they're supposed to, they become visually motion sensitive. <laughs> uh, and they can have real problems in larger environments that don't have a lot of things in the foreground. And then the last thing you can do is cause something called hyperopia, which means one eye will try to focus at a different depth than the other eye. So you'll have one eye focusing here, and the other eye focusing here. And as you can imagine, that's uh, very disorienting. Uh, and it can really happen when you try to look at things that are closer. Here's the thing. You can't just go in as for treatment and just have all that decompensated. Uh, because if you go in and you're like, oh, well, your neck is tight, we'll just make your neck not tight, that could totally decompensate you and feel terrible. Uh, so you got to be really, really careful. Make sure you're working with someone that understands that the nuances and the complexity of that. The system could be giving you these vestibular symptoms between attacks because these circuits I've mentioned have just been starved and damaged by the Meniere's disease. So you've got Meniere's, which is crushing the inside of your ear, right? And that is diminishing the signals that go into the cerebellum and into the brainstem and into the vestibular nuclei. And that's bad over time because neurons, you know, nerve cells, they need fuel and they need activation in order to be healthy. Well, fuel is a lot of this metabolic stuff we've talked about, but the activation is the signals they just should be getting from your inner ear. But with Meniere's over time, it's choking it off. It's diminishing it. It's diminishing the amount of signals that should be going into your brainstem. And those circuits, such as in the cerebellum or the vestibular nuclei, uh, they can get sick. And when they start to malfunction, you can get a whole host of symptoms that I've already mentioned. For treatment, it means you've got to have a metabolic approach. You've got to do the immune system testing. You've got to look at that stuff. And also, you're probably going to have to, at some point, get those circuit problems effectively treated and rehabilitated. When I say rehabilitation, I don't really mean the kind of generic vestibular rehabilitation that you may read about or that you may have even had. And while I'm not saying, I'm not saying that doesn't work, I'm saying for people that have Meniere's disease and have all these different possible, you know, recalibration of the cerebellum, you've got to take each case on their own terms, right? You've got to go through and find out what specifically 
is working and not working and you have to tailor make the treatment. You really can't do cookbook stuff. You really can't do cookie cutter stuff because it just doesn't work. You've got to look at the metabolic stuff first. You don't just rush in and do rehabilitation on someone that has type 3 because some of those symptoms might respond to the appropriate immune system treatment assuming that's what's what's happening. You've got to do the metabolic stuff first and when that kind of gets you as far as it's going to go or if it works and then you do the rehabilitation. Just make sure that if you're someone that has type 3 which is you have rotational attacks of vertigo but you're also getting daily vestibular dizzy symptoms in between those attacks you probably have a circuit problem as well and someone's going to have to deal with that. So make sure you're working with someone that understands how that works, understands that logic. And next time we'll talk about type 4 Meniere's disease. So hope you found this helpful and I'll see you later. Have a good one.